This is Cashflow Ninja, episode 31 with Jeff Schneider. Welcome to the Cashflow Ninja, the podcast empowering and inspiring people to discover how to generate their own income and manage, grow, and protect their own wealth in the new economy. Now, here is your host, MC Laubscher. Hello everyone, MC Lobster here and welcome to another episode of the Cashflow Ninja. I have to say I'm extremely excited about today's show and I think the show will really have our listeners intrigued. So let me ask you a question. Have you ever wished that you could get a cut of the royalties of your favorite songs and artists? Well, there's a way that you can do that. Yep, you heard it. You do not have to be an artist to create income streams through royalties from music, but you can as an investor invest in the royalties that do that for you. We're talking about intellectual property, and this asset class really has not been covered in the media or press at all. You know, and a lot of people have seen stock market volatility. They're not getting the returns really necessarily, so they're looking just for a stable stream of income. And this emerging asset class is really providing that for a lot of investors. So let me give you an example of what I'm talking about. USA Today did an article about my guest's company. Um, The headline was, Website Turns Music Royalties into Investments. Let me just read a paragraph from that article. If you're a Three Doors Down fan and a credit investor, then you might be intrigued by a new investment vehicle that lets you own royalties from a band's popular songs. Just last week, the band's producer put up for auction his royalty rights to 11 tracks. Starting at $5,400 a share, you can own a portion of that portfolio and receive royalty revenue monthly for the next 35 years. He is among a growing number of songwriters and producers using a three-year-old technology platform called Royalty Exchange to sell intellectual property rights at auction and in many cases to use the cash to fund other projects. The Three Doors Down producer plans to use his proceeds to build up his own indie label and fund a new studio. For investors weary of the stock market's ups and downs and interested in diversification, royalty rights are an asset class not tied to the success of financial markets and one that provides monthly income. But before Royalty Exchange came along, they had no easy way of learning about those assets. So the Royalty Exchange was founded in 2011 after identifying the need for a centralized marketplace where royalty owners could monetize their royalties and investors seeking to purchase alternative assets could invest in them. So they connect the artists with the investors. Their mission is simply to provide a platform where all types of royalty assets, such as music, television, and film, or patents, and intellectual property and mineral mineral rights can be bought or sold in an effort to bring value to both the investor and the seller. My guest today is Jeff Schneider, Jeff is currently the Chief Financial Officer at the Royalty Exchange and is on a mission to share the value of owning cash flow assets in any investment portfolio. Jeff is an MBA from Purdue University with a focus on finance. While working in finance for a Fortune 100 company, Jeff also received his CPA from the state of Minnesota. After a few years in the corporate world, Jeff left to pursue an entrepreneurial career and has since been part of four multi-million dollar startups. His interest in royalties came after searching for assets that aren't correlated with the stock market. He now draws from his teaching experience to share the most important points of cash flow investing. Before we are joined by Jeff Schneider, just a reminder that you can download any book for free when you try Audible for 30 days. You can grab your free trial and audio book download at cashflowninja.com forward slash free book download. And my friend Manish Bindi from Gold Silver for Life is hosting a webinar, Three Steps to Cash Flow Gold and Silver. Manish is showing people how to use their gold and silver holdings to create income streams. You can register for this webinar at cashflowninja.com forward slash gold silver webinar. All of our past shows and show notes are available at cashflowninja.com. And you can also join our community and mailing list by texting the word Cashflow Ninja, one word, 
all capitalized, to 44222. That's two fours and three twos. If you sign up to join our community, I will email you three of the top 10 books ever written on building wealth. Hey, this is John Lee Dumas from Entrepreneur on Fire, and you're listening to the Cashflow Ninja podcast with your host, MC Lobsher. You must be prepared to ignite. Jeff, welcome to the show. Thanks, MC. Can you please share a little bit about your background and your journey and how you got involved with the Royalty Exchange? Yeah, I mean, it all started really, I have a, I have a strange obsession with cash flow. So I had a traditional background before this. I was uh, went to MBA, had a CPA, did the corporate world, entered the entrepreneurship world about six or seven years ago. And, you know, I think uh, I always looked to figure out a way to find a, a path up the value chain. And I think uh, if you've ever watched Shark Tank, you kind of have a, uh, and you see Kevin O'Leary, he has that. Mr. Wonderful. Yeah, Mr. Wonderful. He, he always talks about kind of these royalty deals. And so I just, you know, it made a lot of sense to me. I mean, you get paid before anybody else gets paid. And that's, that's exactly the investment strategy or the, you know, even the business strategy that I wanted. So I just kept exploring it. I I had uh, Royalty Exchange had been around since about 2013, Uh, so I joined it as a as an investor actually, and uh, I was interested in buying royalties. And it it just came up the opportunity to to buy the buy out the assets. So uh, I did that. I mean, I think we can build a great marketplace with it, and and we've we've built some really great traction here over the last few months with it. Yeah, you guys are really involved in some fascinating stuff. So some people have even referred to and called the royalty exchange the eBay for royalties. Yeah. Can you please share with my audiences what you guys do, what services you provide, and what value you bring to the marketplace? Yeah, of course. I mean, ultimately, it's about transparency as any marketplace is. You know, so these royalty deals, they, they often happen kind of in the background. And it doesn't really serve investors. It doesn't really serve the sellers when things aren't done out in the open. And that's exactly what we want to be able to bring to the marketplace. So for the sellers, you know, they're, they're, they need a broader audience. The, the alternatives that they have is usually pretty slim and investors are just craving yield. So we know that, you know, there's $10 trillion of, of, uh, treasury bonds or basically government bonds that are trading at negative yields right now. And they're just begging for interest. And so, you know, royalty exchange gives, by bringing things out into the open in a transparent marketplace, it allows kind of these uh, liquidity into a marketplace that has never seen it before. Now, you guys connect the buyers and the sellers, so musicians and artists, etc., all on one platform. Exactly. Let's talk about royalties in music, film, and television. You know, intele- you guys also do intellectual property, energy, and, and a lot more stuff. But let's focus on the music industry for a little bit. So the digitization of music disrupted the music industry, you know, and the profits and billions of dollars was was lost each year. I mean, we all remember Napster. But who didn't use that, by the way? Everybody used Napster at some point, even if they don't want to admit it. Yeah, exactly, exactly, exactly. And then when Napster disappeared, the music streaming followed like an ad-based business model. So people would listen to music on a variety of devices for free. So it also changed the way that music was purchased and how musicians got paid. Now, music consumption went through the roof with all this free streaming and revenues kept on falling. Can you talk about what are some of the things happening in the music industry that's about to change the way that artists get paid for their royalties on intellectual property that would want people investing in these music royalties? Yeah, I mean, that's a that's a great question. And, and certainly the, the industry has seen decline for almost 20 years, really since 1998. And, you know, a lot of it had to do with the digitization. So, you know, everything going to iTunes, you had the piracy problem. Uh, but the, the good news is honestly, we're, we're seeing the bottom out. So 2015, the industry actually grew by 3.2% for the first time since 1998. And, you know, so that it, it's, it's bottoming out, you know, and, and I think there's, there's a great opportunity with the, uh, with the addition of streaming and some of the negotiations, I guess I can go into those, but, you know, 
I guess the streaming really has democratized the way and the consumption of of music. And, you know, if you think of it, and, and most people don't really think of it in this way, but, you know, most of the way people received music in the past is they either had to buy albums or listen to it on the radio. Those radios are owned, those radio stations are owned by, you know, a few large conglomerates, even though they're local stations. And so songs would be played for a period of time and then they make it off the, off the airwaves and, and they're mostly done. Um, you know, you have a few evergreen songs and a few evergreen artists who stick around. But with the in addition of streaming, you know, there was a, a Nielsen study that came out towards the end of last year that songs that are greater than 18 months old. So in the music industry, they think those are the old songs. So songs that are greater than 18 months old ha- are now actually generating more revenue than songs that are less than 18 months old. These new releases. And that's all because of the democratization of how people can consume, how Spotify kind of allows the algorithms to listen to, you know, older music and and uh, puts it in front of you rather than just the new and upcoming artist. Very interesting. Now, uh, why would artists sell the rights to their intellectual property? And can you give a practical example of how an artist would use your service yeah of course i mean that's a great question i mean the the interesting thing is you know there's there's a you have these evergreen artists like don mclean you know who sings american pie he he makes three hundred thousand dollars a year from that song still and that that song's 30 years old right yeah so uh but you know so what we have in most cases we have artists who are interested in selling for probably three primary reasons you know the first is they're musicians who are still in, you know, they're still artists. They're still creating music. And what they want to do is be able to finance or fund their next project. And rather than getting debt or rather than doing, you know, loans or things like that, they can, they can basically take an asset and rather than waiting quarter after quarter for the income, they, they get an upfront payment and they feel they can use it better. So you have some, we have some musicians who are in that case, um, one example we have now is he's a country musician. He's on tour and he just wants to be able to finance his, his next tour. So he's interested in selling a portion. You know, he doesn't have to sell all of it. He's interested in selling a portion of his, of his royalties to really help him kind of elevate his career. Um, on a, you know, the others we have, we have ex musicians, uh, people who used to be in the business. They're no longer in the business anymore. You know, they could be anything from retired or they're day traders or, you know, they're, they're just using the money for other things in their life. And, uh, you know, of course we have a few who they just come to us cause they, they want the cash, you know, they, they, they prefer rather than waiting on the paycheck, they just want it today. And, and, uh, you know, that's great for investors. They have the opportunity to basically get that income stream, uh, at a, at a good yield. The artist would list it you know the royalties on your website and then obviously they put a price on there and just a little bit through the, the re- some of the research that i've done is there's also a floor price a bottom line just on ebay that you won't accept less than you know an, an x number now how how does an artist determine how much the royalties are worth is there an algorithm or are there data points available so that they can kind of be realistic of of what they can generate you know ask for these royalties yeah i mean i think we we walk them through that uh but ultimately it's about getting fair value so of course they have a, a bottom line you know that that they don't want to sell it if it's below that price but you know it's all about fair value so when you bring these things out into the open and out into into you know a market where you have more than one investor making a bid on it then it's uh, you get a much better price you get price discovery in ways that you that these things they don't get that right now and you know the the alternatives that they have are are not uh, they're not in their favor you know if you look at these advances in some ways, those are like payday loans. They're, they're high interest rates. They're, they're not, they're not great for the artists. And so by coming to us, there, there is kind of a dollar, a kind of a bottom value that we work with them. And it's just like any other investment. You have, you have kind of a, some standards in the market. You have comparisons, you know, just same as real estate has market comps. 
And then from there, you, you mark it up with a premium if it's more stable or you, you know, you can discount it if, uh, for, for certain factors, if it's, uh, you know, music that has a lot of volatility in it or things like that. So there's always kind of a, a standard. And then we, we go up and down from there, but it's really unique to each and every artist that we, that we talk to to make sure that it's a, the, really the best solution for them. And do the artists maintain copyright privileges over their work after they sold the royalties or part of the royalties? Yeah, that, I mean, that certainly depends. So it's the same in the, the based on the types of buyers we have. You know, if they're retired and they no longer want the copyright and they're just, you know, they want to move on then we certainly have buyers who are interested in owning the copyright and they feel they can exploit it, you know, for some additional upside out on the investor side. Uh, but so it really does depend on the deal. Uh, there are different types of copyrights that, that we always have to address, but those are all things we walk through with the artist. We try to make sure and, and really we're as a part of our transparency, you know, we want to make sure it's clear to the investors what it is that they're buying you know, the details of if the copyright's included and things like that. So we make all of that clear through our listing process. And and it's a uh, it just makes sure that we have the best outcome for both the, the, the artist and the investor. Interesting. And then so you guys, you know, add a ton of value, bring together the artist, they list and then guys that want to invest for cash flow and get royalty uh, payments, they can come on and bid on this. And obviously there's, there's a, there's a winner for this bid. Now, do you guys get a percentage of the sell price? How, how do you guys monetize this? Yeah. I mean, on, on our end, it's, uh, it's the same as any real estate agent. So it's a, it's a commission on the buy price and, and it's okay. typically the seller who pays. Now let's talk about the securitization options that you guys offer. Can you explain how royalties as an asset backed security works? Yeah, I mean it's uh we're a little bit early to talk about it. We're uh talking through some options, you know, uh, on what the what the end reality looks like, but really that's the that's one of the sexiest parts of this business is, you know, when we when I was first considering it thinking of uh buying a love song you know, and, and on Valentine's Day for your wife, you know, the same way that people buy a star for people that they love, you know. But in this case, you you can not only buy a, a right to it, but they get a paycheck from it every quarter. Right. So right. it's um, it's you know, that's that's definitely the end goal that we want to head down that path. And, you know, the the interesting thing from a regulatory standpoint is that, you know, crowdfunding, which is really popular now. You know, and, and there are some good clauses in crowdfunding that that uh, we're looking at having as a part of our business. But generally, crowdfunding is you you know these the these investors are giving money to these business owners or creators with really no promise of anything in return. And most of these things are going to zero. So the, it's not really an investment. You're just kind of it's more of like a donation, you know. And, uh, right. you know, what we're really excited about in, in our business is that this is one of the few opportunities that there's there's that commitment, because what we're looking at are our cash flows from previous works. You know, so we're not talking about funding a future project that has a whole lot of risk associated with it. We're looking at pricing and selling things that have established cash flow streams to them. And then the artist can use that to fund new work. So it's a it's a way for people to really partner with people that they're following rather than just uh, giving them money and hoping for something in return. Right. It's a whole nother level of the accessibility of an artist. You know, if you like a musician, you know, in today's age, you can follow them on Twitter. You can make conversation, etc. Now you can actually participate yeah. And the royalties that this artist generates yeah, as I mean, well. Every time you hear their song on the radio or that song that you would buy, you know that you're actually getting a little piece of that. That's fantastic. And there seems a, to be a lot of interest in this. I mean, it's essentially a new asset class that you guys have, have created. Um, and if you look at the stock market, there's been a lot of volatility and, and poor returns. So people really desire a stable income stream. 
So let's break it down for our listeners that want to get involved and create income streams through royalties. What's your typical investor profile and do they need to be an accredited investor and, and what's the amount of capital that you need to get started? Yeah, those are, those are great questions. I mean, I think uh, the easiest way to explain it is that we have two primary investor types. We have what uh, what you may call an active investor. So that's somebody who is either in the music industry or they're, you know, if we're looking at intellectual property, they're a lawyer. And they just feel that by buying up pieces of the, you know, buying up the royalties or the copyrights that they can exploit them in a better way and help raise their income. So you have those active investors. I think that's a smaller portion of our of our investor base. A lot of our investors are what we would call passive investors. So these are people who are interested in the cash flow, they're interested in yield and return, right? And so so these these folks are the, all they have to do is once the process is through, they get the they get the royalty checks every quarter or every year depending on the frequency. And so it's that's where most of our investors are. And I don't think uh you don't have to be a, an accredited investor. You know, we're focused as a platform, you know, we are focused on generating you know, auctions and listings of all different sizes. So we've had anything as low as about $5,000 and upwards of $900,000. And so these, the, you know, they're going to trade in different areas and we're, we're committed to trying to make sure that there's a good balance for all of the investors there. Right. And then the other question that I had too. So once, once you've submitted a bid for a royalty of an artist, the bid's accepted. The transaction obviously is done from both ends and the paperwork is filled out. What's got, what's the standard time frame, um, that you see royalty check when you get your first royalty check, basically? It depends on the paying agency. Uh, you know, these are all handled by third party payment agencies, which is, you know, that's a great comfort for our investors. Uh, and so it just depends. I mean, if they're paying quarterly and, you know, for one of the agencies, the paychecks will go out next week. And if we if we just closed a deal, sometimes we'll hold some of the payment so that the investor gets that next deal. Um, but, you know, so say we we sell it next month, it may be two months before the investor gets a check. But uh, we do the transfer quickly. So the transfer is usually done within seven to 10 days. And uh, what what's the long term vision for the royalty exchange? Yeah, I mean, that's a, it's a great question. We're, we're really we want to be the, the marketplace for royalty generating assets. You know, I think, as I mentioned, a lot of these places, you you there's a lot of risk associated with where you're putting your money. You, you have no, you know, you have no clue if you're going to get your money back. You have no clue the direction of it. And so by focusing on assets that are generating cash already, it makes it much easier for a financial investor to kind of model what they're willing to pay for that. And everybody's going to be willing to pay different things, but it's a, it's a place for those investors to come and meet creators. So those are people who are creating the music, the books or the photos or patents that are generating royalties. And it's a, we want to, we want to match them. And that's, you know, there's a, you can, we, I don't want to go deep into detail on this, but if you look at the long term trend of where, asset ownership is and and kind of like the jobs market right so the the right. job market may have significant decreases with the increase of robotics and some things like this so you know owning asset streams owning royalties you know which is at the very top end of of that value chain is exactly where i think a lot there's a extreme growth in this market over the next you know 10 to 20 years and that's what this show is all about. And it doesn't matter what industry you find yourself in. There, there's going to be disruptors. There definitely will in ev- be. In every single one. And I think if you are in an industry, that's a question that you should ask yourself. How, you know, how is this industry going to be disrupted within, you know, it could be this year, it could be the next year, five years, but it definitely will get to that point. Now, Jeff, um, a habit that I've observed from wealthy and successful people is that they're always studying new subjects and learning new skills. What are you currently studying and what new skill sets are you currently learning? Sure. You know, I have a unique approach to this, I think, is in that I don't I don't kind of bury myself into one specific thing and, and you know, dig into that and only that. You know, I've 
I've read everything from like how to win a political campaign to uh, L. Ron Hubbard actually has marketing courses for university that he created years ago. I've gone and studied those things. So I try to like diversify and, and take angles and things on outside of where most people would be. And uh, so I guess on, on that, you know, that's one main thing that I've always th- thought about. Uh, aside from that, in terms of what I'm doing now, I think I'm, I'm always learning. I mean, if, if being a manager is one of the most humbling situations because there's always challenges that you have to have to address. And, you know, there's, there's always this ego that you have to remove from the situation. So I think there's always opportunity for growth there. I'm always reading kind of those, uh, I would say psychology or management type books. And then, uh, I guess one thing, even in the last week or so, we're dealing with a lot of big data. So think about one song may have nine royalties, you know, nine different types of royalties. I don't want to go into too many, but, and they all have different payment agencies. And, and so what we're, we're doing a lot of data analysis on different types of songs and music. And, uh, so I'm, I'm actually starting to learn SQL, uh, which is a skill I, I've always been good at Excel, but, uh, SQL is just one step further that allows me to deal with databases of 10 million lines rather than just a few hundred thousand. I like your approach too, because I've seen, I've seen this just from my background in sports too. Very successful coaches do that too. You know, where they're in one sport, they study what's going on in other sports, and then they also look at corporations and startups just to pick up and learn things, how they build and manage their team. So it's uh, def- definitely an interesting insight. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah, it's all about avoiding tunnel vision, right? Exactly. Uh, just completely opening up the mind and, and seeing, you know, looking at things from different perspectives. Now, what's the best advice you've ever received and the most important lesson that you've learned on your journey of personal fulfillment and business success? Yeah, I mean, I, I can't really take credit for this one. This is uh, my my partner and, and who I consider my mentor is uh, his name's Matt, and he he's always had this mentality of rush to conflict, and so it it sound it's it's actually counterintuitive to what most people will think. You know, in today's world, it's all about being kind of politically conscious and politically correct. And if you if you think of the rush to conflict. It really helps you set priorities. It makes you take ownership of the situation. It has urgency behind it. And, um, you know, it removes the ego. And so that, that thought is something that I, I do think about frequently. And I, I can't say I do it well all the time, but I'm, I'm always thinking about ways that we need to, to address conflict in the, in the right way and make sure that you get the right outcome, you know, from that conflict. Jeff, if you cannot pass on any money to your children and grandchildren, and you are only allowed to pass on five principles to them to build wealth, achieve success, and happiness, what would they be? Interesting. I can think of three off the top of my head. And, you know, I think the first one is, and I probably said it here even a couple times, is avoid the crowd, you know, and it's uh, that contrarian mindset is, is not only in investing itself, but, you know, the, the crowd mindset on what's an asset and what's a liability. You know, those, those types of things I think are important to, to consider, you know, where a lot of times that, that mindset is, it's off on when you think deeper about it. Uh, so I think that's, that's definitely one. I think cash is king, you know, is a, is obviously a, a very common and familiar one. That's a big part of the reason that we're, you know, we think we have a great thing with royalty exchange and we want to make sure that investors recognize that. And, you know, there's a Peter Lynch quote, I guess, as the third thing would be, you know, know what you own and why you own it. And so those, the deeper thought of, of those, you know, it's similar to the crowd. You know, you could buy stuff because that's what the crowd does. But in reality, if you know what you own and why you own it, it makes sure that you're, making the right conscious decisions you're thinking things through you're you're aware of the risks you're aware of all of the different kind of paths that it, and potential outcomes that there may be so that reflective mindset is one that you know i think has to apply for somebody in in their personal life as well as in their financial and wealth career you know path Right. I like that, too, because especially in today's world, too, you know, we're 
we're, we're so product focused as a society everywhere and we're almost like a you know <laughs> like a goldfish in a fishbowl you know you we with uh with the attention being drawn in different directions but if you have an overall strategy you know what you're doing and why you're doing it and you've got systems around that um and then then you'll stick through it even through the tough times too if you if you focus and you know what you're doing then you're not getting as distracted as you usually do exactly yeah and i guess i could add maybe even a fourth one of of uh and maybe I, I may not even live up to this for myself, but don't retire. You know, I think uh, having you can you can set up your your life in a way that, you know, as you get later on, you're working less. Nobody's requiring or demanding anything from you. But I think, you know, if you're doing if you're doing things that are interesting, you know, that that don't retire, kind of keep keep income flowing is is a way to make sure that your, you know, your finances are always in order. That's great. Yeah, that's a, that's part of the philosophy of the show too. Just redefining what retirement is. You know, building and creating income streams and unplugging yourself from the system, but still managing it and not completely retiring yeah. <laughs> away from that. I, I can't even imagine what retirement looks like, honestly. I mean, well, I don't know what I would do all day. I mean, a lot of people kind of have their bucket list, but uh, you know, I think if you if you try to do some interesting things, you know, you can do them while you're working. You know, you don't need to wait for retirement for all of that. Right. Learn that that skill or take that cooking class or whatever's on your bucket list. If you have income streams coming in that you're managing on the side or just a, lo- a couple of hours a day, I mean, you, it enables you to, to get, hit that bucket list sooner than later. Exactly. Are there any books that you would recommend to my audience? Yeah. You know, the, that last question reminded me of a book. Uh, you know, I may have only had three or four rules there, but there is a book by John Spooner that's called No One Ever Told Us That. And it's a, I haven't read it for probably four or five years, but I, it's a, it's a really interesting book. It's an ex banker. He worked for Citigroup, I think, for many years in his career. And, uh, he writes letters to his college grandchildren. And, you know, basically he's passing on some financial advice, some life advice, career advice. And uh, it's, it's a really interesting and well done book, I think. Um, outside of that, I mean, of course, there's always the stalwarts that I'm sure many of your guests have. It's influenced by Cialdini or Caldini, uh, fooled by randomness and uh, the one minute manager since we talked about management here. But but uh, I would say the unique one, John Spooner, if everybody goes picks that up, I think they'll be happy with it. That's great. I'm definitely putting that one on my list. Jeff, how can my audience learn more about you and your company and uh, stay informed of all the projects that you are involved in? Yeah, that's a good question. I, I'm I'm not uh, very on I'm not on social media a lot, honestly. So they're welcome to connect with me on LinkedIn. But but really, the best way to to stay up to date and learn more about Royalty Exchange is just royaltyexchange.com. There's uh, we've got educational information there. We've got uh, for investors, for potential sellers, and then uh, we've got some news and all that is available on royaltyexchange.com. They can check out. We've got about six or eight auctions that will be live here in the next month. So there's a lot of activity there that they can kind of acquaint themselves to. On your website, you guys have a ton of resources to educate yourself and, and study and learn all about this new asset class um, that you guys essentially are creating. So, but thank you so much for coming on the show, Jeff. I really appreciate it. Thank you for sharing your knowledge and your journey and just sharing information about the exciting stuff that you guys are involved with. Really appreciate it. And thank you for adding so much value um, to the show today. Thanks a lot, MC. It was a pleasure. Thank you for joining me and my guest, Jeff Schneider from the Royalty Exchange. Remember to grab your free audiobook download from Audible. You can download any book for free when you try Audible for 30 days. You can grab your free trial and audiobook download at cashflowninja.com forward slash free book download. And remember to sign up for the free webinar hosted by my friend Manish Bindi from Gold Silver for Life, Three Steps to Cashflow Gold and Silver. Manish is showing people how to use their gold and silver holdings to create income streams. You can register for the webinar at cashflowninja.com forward slash gold silver webinar. All of our past shows and show notes are available at cashflowninja.com and you can sign up for our community and mailing list by texting the word Cashflow Ninja, one word, all capitalized, to 44 
two, two, two. That's two fours and three twos. If you sign up to join our community, I will email you three of the top 10 books ever written on building wealth. If there's any way I can provide more value to you and serve you better, please go to our contact page and send me an email or leave me a voicemail on our SpeakPipe voicemail line. That's our show, everyone. Until next time, live a life of passion and purpose on your terms. You have been listening to the Cash Flow Ninja with your host, MC Laubscher, the podcast empowering and inspiring people to discover how to generate their own income and manage, grow, and protect their own wealth in the new economy. Today's show notes and resources are available on our website, CashflowNinja.com. This presentation is for educational and informational purposes only. The information being presented and considered does not consider your particular financial objectives or situation, and it does not make personalized recommendations. This material is not intended to replace the advice of a qualified tax and legal advisor or other qualified professionals, and you should not use the information in place of a customized consultation with a licensed professional regarding your specific personal financial objective, situation, and needs. We believe the information provided is reliable, but we do not guarantee its accuracy, timeliness, or completeness. 